Now, here is Dr. Jeremiah with his message, The Rapture of the Church. All of you know that we live in Southern California, and all of you know that every part of the country has its own issues. We don't have too many tornadoes in California. We have earthquakes. We don't have many floods. We have fires. And it was back in October of 2007 when the fires created what has been described as the biggest evacuation in state history. 350,000 homes were vacated in Southern California as 16 simultaneous wildfires swept through our community. I will never forget it. Strange as it may seem, I was preaching at that time on the prophetic word. And that Sunday after the fires, I was scheduled to give a message called the rapture. And early in the week, because of the fires and because of the prominence of our church in the community, a newspaper reporter from the Union Tribune called me and wanted to know what I was going to preach on to all of the people in our community because of the fires. And as I focused my attention on the scheduled message, I was awed by the strange similarity of a massive evacuation at the beginning of a wildfire and another massive evacuation before a future time of earthquakes, fire, and chaos. And so my message was scheduled to be the great disappearance, and on the spot I changed it to the great evacuation. Everybody came to church that Sunday. <laughs> the Bible tells us that there is coming a day when millions of people will be evacuated from this world in a moment. It will be a time of chaos never before experienced in this earth. Those of us who are watching what is happening in the world today believe that the time for that event is drawing near. It has been described like this by various writers. Jumbo jets plummet to earth as they no longer have a pilot at the control. Driverless buses and trains and subways and cars cause unimaginable disaster. Classrooms are suddenly without teachers. Doctors and nurses seem to abandon their patients in the middle of surgical operations, and patients vanish from operating tables. Children disappear from their beds. People run through the streets looking for missing family members who were there just moments ago, and panic grips every household, every city, and every country. I remember some years ago, some people designed a newspaper that could be used after the rapture. It had headlines chronicling the missing people in the community. And here's one of the headline articles that they imagined. At 12.05 last night, a telephone operator reported three frantic calls regarding missing relatives. Within 15 minutes, all communications were jammed with similar inquiries. A spot check around the nation found the same situation in every city. Sobbing husbands sought information about the mysterious disappearance of wives. One husband reported, I turned on the light to ask my wife if she remembered to set the clock, but she was gone. Her bedclothes were there, her watch was on the floor, but she had vanished. An alarmed woman calling from Brooklyn tearfully reported, my husband just returned from the late shift. I kissed him and he disappeared in my arms. The event that I'm describing is what the Bible calls the rapture. Before we look at the passage of scripture that describes this event, I wanna answer a question that a little girl asked her mother after she heard me preach a similar truth at Shadow Mountain. It was a very insightful question and the mother told me as I was working out the next day in the gym, here's what my little girl asked me and you need to give me an answer so I can go home and tell her what the answer is. Here was her question. Dr. Jeremiah keeps talking about all the signs that are developing concerning the Lord's return. And then in the next breath, he says, and nothing needs to happen before Jesus comes back to take us home to be with him. Now, Mom, that doesn't make any sense to me. Either there are signs or there aren't signs. What does the pastor mean? It's a very insightful question that demands an answer. And the best way for me to answer it is to show you a little diagram on the screen behind me. 
This diagram will help you understand that there is coming a time when some events are going to take place and they're going to be sequenced. The first thing that you see on this chart is the first coming of Christ. And of course, then after the first coming of Christ comes the next event. The next event is the church age. That's where we are right now. We're living in the church age, the age between the coming of Christ the first time and the coming of Christ the second time. How many of you know what the next thing is? Right after the church age, what's going to change everything forever is this event we call the rapture. Notice, the rapture shows Jesus coming from heaven, but he doesn't come all the way to the earth. The Bible says we're going to be caught up into the heavens to be with him, and then we're going to go back to heaven with him in the rapture. After the rapture, a period of great tribulation will take place on this earth for seven years. At the end of the seven-year tribulation, the second coming of Christ takes place. Now, here's where the disconnect is for most people who get confused about the future. The rapture and the second coming of Christ are not the same thing. The rapture is when Jesus comes back to take his people back to heaven with him, then tribulation on the earth takes place, and then the second coming is when Jesus comes back, and the Bible says he comes with all of the people of God and with all the angels and sets up his kingdom on this earth. Now, here's the answer to that young girl's question. There are no signs for the rapture. The rapture could happen at any time, but the New Testament is filled with signs for the second coming. But guess what? Every event casts its shadow before us. So if there are signs for the second advent, and they tell us that the second advent is coming, that means the rapture seven years before that, so the rapture's surely coming, isn't it? So when we study the prophecies of the Bible, and we see the regathering of Israel, and we see the collection of the nations of Europe, and we see all the things that are happening on the prophetic scene, what we know is this, our redemption is drawing nigh. The Bible tells us that Jesus is going to come back, and I've, I know I might embarrass myself a little bit by saying this, but I tell people everywhere I go, I expect to be here when Jesus comes back for the rapture. I believe that things are so close that if the Lord lets me live out my life, I'm going to see the rapture. And I've come up with a little slogan, I'd rather see the upper taker than the undertaker, wouldn't you? <laughs> I'm really looking forward to that. I am. <laughs> Now, according to the book of Revelation, when Jesus comes back for the second advent, every eye shall see him. But when the rapture happens, it's going to be very quickly, very quietly happening. And it is the answer to the promise that Jesus made in John chapter 14. Do you remember when Jesus was about to go away after his disciples had understood his death, burial, and resurrection a little bit, and Jesus was preparing them for what was to happen? And they didn't understand it. And some of them said, Lord, where are you going? And Lord, how do you get there? And Jesus said to them in John 14, don't let your heart be troubled. You believe in God, believe also in me. In my Father's house are many mansions, and if it were not so, I would have told you. I am going to prepare a place for you, and I go to prepare this place for you so that I can come again and receive you unto myself, that where I am, there you may be also. And the rapture is the fulfillment of that promise of the Lord Jesus. He has gone to heaven. He is preparing a place for us. And one day soon, he's going to come back, and he's going to take us up to meet him in the air, and we're going to go to the place that he's been preparing. Now, if the Lord created the earth in six days and rested on the seventh, he's been working on heaven for several thousand years. Can you imagine what kind of place that's going to be? I mean, it is going to be a place like anything you have ever seen in your life. And the hope of the believer is this, that before tribulation breaks out on this earth, the Lord Jesus Christ is going to return. Now, the real, the real text that teaches this truth is found in 1 Thessalonians chapter 4. So if you brought your Bibles tonight, you might want to turn there. Now, if you didn't, I brought a Bible, and we're going to put it up on the screen so you can see uh, what these scriptures say. The writings to the Thessalonians, to the church in Thessalonica, were, were very important. Let me explain to you what I mean. The Christians who lived in this little city of Thessalonica, they had heard about Jesus coming back, but they didn't understand it. They, in fact, th they thought that Jesus was going to come back in their lifetime, and their thought was, well, what about our parents who already died and they're in the grave? What about our grandparents, our godly friends who've already died? What about them? They're not going to be here when Jesus comes back, so what's going to happen to them? And so 
the writer of the book of First Thessalonians wrote this letter to them to explain to them the answer to their question. And I want you to open your Bibles, if you will, to First Thessalonians and the fourth chapter. And I want to ask you to listen to it as if you had never heard it before, because this is the answer that Paul gave to the Thessalonians concerning what was going to happen to their loved ones. What was going to take place if Jesus came back and their loved ones had already died? So here we are in 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, and listen to his words. But I do not want you to be ignorant, brethren, concerning those who have fallen asleep, lest you sorrow as others who have no hope. For if we believe that Jesus died and rose again, even so God will bring with him those who sleep in Jesus. For this we say to you by the word of the Lord, that we who are alive and remain unto the coming of the Lord will by no means precede those who are asleep. For the Lord himself will descend from heaven with a shout, with the voice of an archangel, with the trumpet of God, and the dead in Christ shall rise first. Then we who are alive and remain shall be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air, and so we will always be with the Lord. Comfort one another with these words. Now, the writer of this passage begins by giving to his readers a preview of what's going to happen in the future, sort of a little overture of these events. And he begins by trying to dispel their ignorance. He begins in verse 13 by saying, I don't want you to be ignorant, brethren. And I've observed that whenever that passage is referred to in the scripture, whenever that little phrase is in the scripture, you know what it means? They're ignorant brethren. It means they don't know what they need to know. In fact, uh, J. Vernon McGee once said that the largest congregation in the world was the congregation of the ignorant brethren. I don't know if that's true or not. He was a little more uh, edgy than I would be. But the apostle begins by using this phrase that shows that the Thessalonians didn't understand what was going on. So he's writing this to dispel their ignorance. And you know, one of the reasons we study the Bible is so we can learn things we don't know. And people say, well, I don't believe in, in the prophetic scriptures, or my pastor doesn't preach from prophecy. Did you know that about a fourth of the Bible is prophetic? You decide not to preach on prophecy, you're not going to know a lot of stuff. You're going to be part of that congregation that Dr. McGee talked about, the congregation of the ignorant brethren. So we need to open our Bibles and ask God to help us understand what the scripture says. The first thing that he does after he dispels their ignorance is he describes a believer's death. And this is a very interesting thing. Notice what he says. He says, I don't want you to be ignorant concerning those who have fallen asleep. The word that is used of Christians who have died in the text of the New Testament is a word which is, the meaning of the word is to sleep, but to sleep in death. In fact, if you go through the scriptures in the New Testament, you'll be surprised how many times that word is used for death, and you don't even think about it because you just sort of assume it. Let me explain to you. Let me give you some verses. We'll put them up on the screen quickly. John 11, 11, concerning Lazarus, these things Jesus said, and after that he said to them, our friend Lazarus sleeps, but I go that I may wake him up. Now let me ask you a question. Was Lazarus sleeping? <laughs> no, the Bible said he'd been in the grave and he'd already started to stink. <laughs> He wasn't sleeping, he was dead. But sleep is the term that is used for death of Christians. Once again in Acts chapter seven we read, then Stephen knelt down and cried out with a loud voice, Lord, do not charge them with this sin. And when he had said this, he fell asleep. Did Stephen take a nap? No, he was stoned to death, he died. He fell asleep. In Acts 13, 36 we read this about David. This is the clearest one of all. For David, after he had served his own generation by the will of God, fell asleep, and he was buried with his fathers and saw corruption. So what happened to David? Did he take a nap? No, he, he died. And in 1 Corinthians 15, 20, we read, but now Christ is risen from the dead and has become the first fruits of those who have fallen asleep. Did you know that if you're a Christian, death is just like falling asleep? Just like falling asleep. That's what the Bible says. And we're going to learn why in just a moment. The early Christians had this wonderful word for the burying places of their dead. The Greek word is koimaterion, and don't get caught up in that word, but it means a rest house for strangers, a sleeping place. Now, hang on. It is the same word from which we get our English word cemetery. 
The same word was used in that day for inns or hotels or motels like the Ramada Inn or the Holiday Inn. The same word that was used for cemetery was used for hotels. And you expect to get up the next day when you go to a hotel and continue your journey. And this is the picture of the place where you bury your believing loved ones. The body of the believer has just been put into a hotel until the resurrection. Isn't that an interesting thought? So where's my loved one? Oh, they're in the hotel down here at the cemetery. I mean, that'll open some people's eyes. It'll start a conversation for you if you want one. One day the Lord is going to come back and that body is going to be raised up. And the main truth here that we need to remember is just as physically we sleep and we expect to awake tomorrow in the hotels where we're staying, so as Christians, when we die, we can be assured that one day we'll be awakened by the return of the Lord, we'll come out of those hotels, and we'll go to be with the Lord in the heavens. What a great truth. Now, after he dispels their ignorance and he describes their death, he defends the believer's hope. And this is what he says. Lest you sorrow, he says, I want you to know this truth so you won't sorrow like others who don't have any hope. For if we believe that Jesus died and rose again, even so God will bring with him those who sleep in Jesus. Now, Paul says to these people in Thessalonica, he says, I don't want you to sorrow like others who don't have any hope. He didn't say, I don't want you to sorrow. He said, I just don't want you to sorrow like those who don't have any hope. How many of you know there's a difference between sorrowing without hope and sorrowing with hope? You know, I was a chaplain when I was a student at Dallas Seminary. I was a chaplain at the Baylor University Hospital for about two years. I didn't know what I was doing. It was a job. I needed a job, and so I went there. And I'll tell you, it was the scariest place I'd ever been for a long time in my life. I was on duty with a little beeper, and every time something bad happened in the hospital, they called me and said, get to the family room. And I met people from every imaginable place. Most of the time, people who were brought there, families who were there, whose family members were in deep trouble. Some of them had been killed in accidents. I was a young seminary student trying to figure out life, and I made a wonderful observation during those years. I got to the place where I could walk in the family room and tell you if the people involved were Christians or not, and I didn't even have to ask a question. Because you see, Christians sorrow. They sorrow just as genuinely as others. And don't let anybody give you this nonsense that if you're a Christian, you shouldn't cry when people die or you should be sad when things go wrong. That's not true. The Bible says Jesus wept. But here's the difference. It's not sorrow without hope. And if you've ever seen anyone sorrow without hope, there's a sense of despair in their sorrow. I remember one day walking into that family room and seeing a woman down on her knees, pounding her head into the carpet because of the despair she felt over the loss of a loved one. Listen to me, ladies and gentlemen, the Lord Jesus came into this world to take the sting out of death. And what that means is that though we do sorrow when we lose somebody we love, we don't sorrow like the other part of the world who doesn't know him because we know that death is not the end. In fact, it's the beginning of something much better than we've ever experienced before. Now, here's why we don't have to sorrow. Here's where our hope is. Notice what he says in verses 13 and 14. He says, if we believe that Jesus died and he rose again, is it too hard to believe that he can perform the same miracle in your life and in mine? I mean, this explains how Christ took the sting out of death for believers. He's changed what would have been death into sleep by his own death. This then is the cause for not grieving. I'm not afraid to die. I don't want to die. I'm like the little boy in the class who the teacher said, how many of you want to go to heaven when you die? Everybody raised their hand but one little boy in the back row, and she went back and she said, son, don't you want to go to heaven when you die? Oh, he said, yeah, when I die, but I thought you were getting up a load for tonight. You know what? I don't want to go to heaven tonight. You know what I'm saying? <laughs> I want to go to heaven when God's ready to take me to heaven, and I'm not afraid to go to heaven because I know that there is something far better awaiting us because of our faith in Christ. Now, in the next part of this section of Scripture, verse 15, we've already seen the careful preview of the rapture. Now we're going to see the promise of the rapture. Notice verse 15. For this we say to you by the word of the Lord, that we who are alive and remain until the coming of the Lord will by no means precede those who are asleep. 
Paul introduces this verse with a statement of divine authority. Notice he said, by the word of the Lord. This means that Paul got this truth directly from Almighty God. It means that this is a statement of great importance that was communicated to Paul directly. Paul tells these people that not only will those who have died in Christ be present at the return of the Lord, but they actually will have the place of prominence. Remember what they were worried about? Their loved ones had died. They knew Jesus was coming back, but what about mom and dad? What about grandma and grandpa? What about Uncle Jerry and, and Aunt Judy? What about them? They were Christians, and they're dead. What happened to them? And Jesus said, Paul, you tell those folks. Don't worry about that. In fact, let them know that those who have gone on in the grave are actually going to take first place in the rapture. They're going to be raised first. Isn't that what it says? Somebody said, why do they have to go first? Well, they got six feet further to go, right? They have to have a little head start, right? <laughs> God's going to raise them up first. What an encouragement that must have been to those people in that church who never had heard this truth before. Where are our parents? Jesus is coming back, but where are they? And Paul said, listen, God's already provided for that. And then he gives them this incredible story of what's going to happen. He says, they shall not proceed. And he begins in verses 16 and 17 to outline how things are going to happen when the rapture occurs. So let's go through this little chronological, this little chronological program of the rapture, verses 16 and 17. Notice, first of all, first thing, there's going to be a return. Verse 16, for the Lord himself will descend from heaven with a shout, with the voice of an archangel, and with the trumpet of God. The Bible says the next thing that's going to happen for everyone who's a Christian is the skies are going to be parted and Jesus Christ is going to come back. He's going to return to take those who have trusted in him to heaven. And notice, it's the Lord himself who is coming. He's not sending the Holy Spirit. He's not sending his angels. He's not sending any of the disciples who've gone on ahead. He himself is coming. In fact, you remember when he was taken up in, in the ascension that the angel said, men of Galilee, why do you stand gazing up into heaven? This same Jesus who was taken up from you into heaven is going to come in the same manner as you saw him go into heaven. How did they see him go? They saw him go physically. They saw him go personally. So how should we expect him to come back? Physically and personally, Jesus Christ is coming back very soon. Now, the detail of this passage is very complete. In fact, we're even given the sounds that we're going to hear before this happens. It says, the shout, the voice of the archangel, and the trump of God. Three sounds. We should be listening for these sounds, the Bible says. One day we'll be going through our motions, living our lives, and that sound will be heard. You say, how will I know it? Well, it's going to be a sound like a trumpet, like the voice of an archangel. It's going to be that kind of a sound like you've never heard before. I promise you, when you hear it, you'll know it. <laughs> There's going to be a return. And then the Bible says there's going to be a resurrection. And the dead in Christ shall rise first. In a split second, the Lord is going to call all believers to himself to share his glory. Not one will remain behind. Now, isn't it hard to imagine what this would be like? Now, God has given me a fertile imagination, so let me share some of my imagination about what this will be like. Millions of people from all parts of the earth are going to feel a tingling sensation pulsating through their bodies. They are all suddenly energized. Those with physical deformities will be healed. The blind suddenly will see. Wrinkles will disappear on the elderly as their youth is restored. As these people marvel at their physical transformation, they are lifted skyward. Those in buildings go right through the ceiling and roof without any pain or damage. The flesh and bones seem to dematerialize, defying all known laws of physics and biology. And as they travel heavenward, some of them see and greet those who have risen from their graves. And after a brief mystical union, they all vanish from sight. You say, Dr. Jeremiah, you have been staying up too late at night reading too many mysteries. <laughs> no. No, I don't know if it'll be exactly like that, but the scripture gives us enough information to know it will be very much like that. The Bible says that we are going to be changed in a moment in the twinkling of an eye. The Bible says we shall not all sleep, but we shall all be changed. Now, the Bible says that this is going to happen as surely as we are here. 
You say, is there any illustration in the Bible of what a rapture is going to be like? And I want to tell you, salted in the Scripture from the beginning of the Old Testament throughout the Scripture, there are little pictures, little vignettes, little examples, and I'm just going to share them with you quickly. Here's what the Bible says about Enoch in Hebrews chapter 11, verse 5. By faith, Enoch was taken away so that he did not see death, and he was not found because God had taken him. For before he was taken, he had this testimony that he pleased God. One of these days, friends, we're going to be taken. God's going to take us to heaven. What about Elijah? You remember Elijah? Then it happened as they continued on and talked that suddenly a chariot of fire appeared with horses of fire and separated the two of them, and Elijah went up to heaven in a whirlwind, and he didn't die. He bypassed death like we will when the rapture happens. And what about the apostle Paul? He had a little visitation to heaven, didn't he? He said in 2 Corinthians, I know a man in Christ who 14 years ago, whether in the body I do not know, or whether out of the body I do not know, God knows such a one. He was caught up into the third heaven, and I know such a man, whether in the body or out of the body, I do not know. God knows how he was caught up into paradise and heard inexpressible words which it is not lawful for a man to utter. We are going to be taken. We are going to be caught up. <laughs> That's what the scripture says. And then what about Jesus Christ? The Bible says, and while they look steadfastly into the heavens, Jesus Christ in his ascension went up. He went up. Behold, two men stood by them in white apparel who also said, men of Galilee, why do you stand gazing up into heaven? This same Jesus who was taken from you is going to come back in the same manner as you saw him go into heaven. The Bible says Jesus went up. So if you just look at those little illustrations, Enoch was taken and Jesus went up. Just like it's going to be for us when the rapture happens. One of these days, we're going to be taken. One of these days, we're going to be caught up. The word rapture is not in the Bible as a word. It is coined because the word means to seize or to catch up into another dimension. So there's going to be a return. Jesus is going to come back. What's the second thing? The dead in Christ are going to be raised, and they're going to go up first. Then we who are alive and remain, we're going to be caught up to be with them in the heavens. We're going to meet our loved ones who've gone on before us, who are in the grave. They're going to, get, they're going to check out of their motel, and they're going to be caught up with us. And the Bible says we're going to meet together in the air. So there's not only a return, a resurrection, and a rapture, but there's going to be a reunion. I remember as a little boy growing up in my daddy's church, we used to sing this song, there's going to be a meeting in the air in the sweet, sweet by and by. You remember that? Well, that's not just a good lyric for a good hymn. That's the truth of the Word of God. One of these days, we're going to go to heaven. And I, I take I create joy in this because, listen to this. While those who die today go to the place where, where they're going to await the resurrection, the Bible says that none of us is going to get a priority to see the actual final heaven before anyone else. We're going to enjoy that experience together. I've always been a great sports fan. I love basketball, especially because that's what I played when I was in college. On the West Coast, we had this wonderful experience uh, because of the time change. When Michael Jordan was in his prime, we used to get WGN, and about 4 o'clock in the afternoon, I'd come home from work and I could watch the Chicago Bulls. Every game was on WGN. And you all remember Michael Jordan. You know, he might not have a great game every night, but you always knew somewhere in that game he was going to break out and do something heroic that you'd never seen anybody do before. And so I would sit there with my two sons when they were growing up, and when Michael Jordan would take off at the foul line and go flying through the air and slam dunk, uh, you know, we'd jump out of our chair and we'd high-five each other and we'd be so excited to watch that. How many of you know there's something about enjoying something together with people that's not the same when you're by yourself? Now, I'm home by myself at home. And uh, I have to honestly tell you, we don't have much in San Diego that you want to high-five about right now. We're having a pretty rough time this year. But even when you see something, you know, I kind of look around sometimes. Who do I high-five? And I want to tell you something. When the Lord Jesus comes back and he catches us up to be with him, 
our moms and dads and friends and loved ones are gonna be caught up together with us and we're gonna reunite and then we're going to heaven together, amen? Amen. And the Bible says that the Lord is going to come and take us to heaven. You know, in the Old Testament, New Testament cultures, when somebody came to a city, somebody of great prominence, they would send someone out of the city to meet them and bring them in. The Lord Jesus Christ is coming out of the city to meet us. We're going to be reunited in the air, and we're going to go to heaven together. There's going to be a great reunion. The Bible says that we who are alive and remain shall be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air, and so we shall always be with the Lord. Ladies and gentlemen, that's our final place, our final place where we're going to be forever and ever with the Lord Jesus Christ. Now, I want you to notice that the passage doesn't end with this chronological organization of the rapture. The passage says that there's a purpose for us to know this truth. Verse 18 says, therefore, comfort one another with these words. The word comfort is the same word that is translated elsewhere in the Bible by the word encouragement. So we could read that text this way, therefore, encourage one another with these words. I want to tell you something. A lot of people need to be encouraged with these words. We seem to have lost the doctrine of God's plan for the future. We don't seem to preach very much on the rapture anymore. So oftentimes in our churches, our fellow believers face death just like they didn't know the Lord. And people go to the hospitals and they don't have a word of hope. As many of you know, some years ago, I went through two bouts of lymphoma cancer. I was treated at the Scripps Hospital. And my doctor is a wonderful man, an incredible physician, and he's a South African Jew. He's a wonderful man. We've had some great discussions. I was going through lymphoma at the very same time as his rabbi was going through lymphoma, almost exactly the same kind and the same treatment. And so when we got into remission, uh, Dr. Sabin got this idea that he should have a, a night at the hospital where his rabbi and I would talk about our cancer and our faith. Now, I had met this rabbi, and I want to tell you something. He was brilliant. He used words I'd never heard before. I mean, I talked with him, and I thought, oh, my goodness, I don't belong in his category. So when he asked me if I would come and we could have this little discussion about our cancer and our faith, I was a little intimidated by it. But it didn't last long. I was asked to speak first. And I got up and I talked about how people had prayed for me and how God had been so real to me and how he had helped me and how I knew that I was in his hands and that I win either way. And if I, if I get to stay around, I'm, I'm okay. And if I go to heaven, I'm okay. And I'd really hope. And, and I just lifted up Jesus Christ. And I remember on our way over there, Don and I were in the car and I was kind of nervous. And, and I said, honey, we got to pray. I didn't know what to pray. And this is what I prayed, Lord Jesus Help me to bring your presence into this room tonight. That's all I know how to do. So I tried to bring the presence of Jesus into that room. And then my friend got up, and he talked about how since God didn't have anything to do with him getting sick, why should he ever ask God to do anything to get him better? There wasn't any life after death. There wasn't any hope. There wasn't any reason for us to get all revved up. People get sick. You should just deal with it, et cetera, et cetera. And I thought to myself, if that's all the hope we have, why would you want to be a priest? Why would you want to be a rabbi? Why would you want to be a preacher? And I noticed at the end of the time, when it was all over, and I'm not being critical of, of anybody here tonight, I'm just telling you what happened. There was a whole line of folks, because all the people from the hospital were involved, all the nurses and people who were not on duty, and they were all asking me questions about my faith. And I looked over, and my friend was all by himself in the corner over there, because how many of you know you can't go through life without hope? You can't go through life without faith. If you don't believe God has a plan for your life, you're going to have a miserable life. And it's not just think so, hope so, womp up your faith. The Bible says faith is the bedrock truth of life. Hebrews 10 says the just live by faith. And I want to tell you something. The rapture of the church and the coming of Christ is the most encouraging doctrine you can ever preach to people who are going through trouble. You know, we're living in some pretty difficult times right now, are we not? And people having kinds of problems they never had before in their life. So in light of what Paul has presented, here's the question we need to ask. 
how shall we live? If we believe that Jesus is coming back to take us to be with him, how shall we live? Well, first of all, we should be looking for the Lord, shouldn't we? If we believe that, we should be looking for him. We should anticipate it. When was the last time you even thought about the fact that Jesus was coming back? The Bible says in Titus 2.13, we're to be looking for the blessed hope and glorious appearing of our great God and Savior, Jesus Christ. Philippians 3.20 says, for our citizenship is in heaven, from which we also eagerly wait for the Savior. And 1 Thessalonians 1 says, we wait for his Son from heaven. Are we looking for Jesus? You know, one of the things that helps you deal with life on earth is to remember that there's life elsewhere. It's life in heaven that God has provided. And keep your eyes on Jesus. Not only should we be looking for Jesus, but the Scripture says we should be living for Jesus, shouldn't we? In fact, one of the interesting things about prophecy is wherever you see a prophetic truth in the Bible, almost inevitably married to it is some practical admonition that has been given to us to tell us what to do. For instance, Titus 2, 11 and 15 says, For the grace of God that brings salvation has appeared to all men, teaching us that denying ungodliness and worldly lusts, we should live soberly, righteously, and godly in this present age, looking for that blessed hope and glorious appearing of the Lord Jesus Christ. Somebody said, well, if you believe Jesus is coming back, you can just live any way you want. No, you can't. If you really believe that Jesus is coming back, you don't want to be ashamed at his coming. Did you ever, when you were growing up, have your parents leave you at home alone to take care of things? You thought they were coming back on a certain day? You let things kind of go, and I remember doing this. The day before they were to come back, boy, you cleaned everything up the best you could. If your parents could only have seen like it was the day before, they'd never left you alone again. But you know the way you keep that from happening? You just take care of things every day. Something happened in our community during those fires I mentioned at the beginning of my message, something that never happened before. Pretty amazing if you want to know the truth. We had a lot of people that had been told to get out of the community because fire was coming their way. And some of them didn't. In fact, you probably remember reading about some of the tragedies of people who, were, who lost their lives in that fire because they waited too long and they couldn't get out. So they called together a group of experts and they put together a program called Reverse 9-11. It's really interesting what they did. As I understand it, they put people's names who lived in the fire zones on a phone list that was called in case the fires threatened their homes and safety. In other words, when the fire officials thought that area was in danger, they set in motion a massive calling process that alerted the homeowners that it was time to leave. For reasons unknown, some homeowners didn't put themselves on the list, and so they didn't get the call. Others were called, but by the time the call came, their phone lines were down, so they didn't hear the call either. I remember hearing the call was, simple, fire, get out. That's all the call said. So when the fire was moving toward an area in Southern California, in, in San Diego County, all of these 9-11 names had been programmed into the, and they just had to go to the computer and push a button and all the phone numbers that were in that list were, were called and when they picked up the phone, what they heard was, fire, get out. And they were warned about coming tragedy. But if people didn't have their name on the list, they didn't get the call. In many ways, the rapture operates like the reverse 9-11 system. If your name's on the list, you'll be evacuated before the tribulation. But if your name is not on the list, you're going to be left behind. The Bible teaches that Jesus Christ is coming back for all those who have placed their faith in him. If you have not done that, you will be left behind. Today, you can get your name on the list. You can say, Lord Jesus, I want to receive you as my Savior. I don't want to be left behind. I want to go to heaven. When you come back for your own, I want to be included in that number. You say, well, Pastor Jeremiah, that, that's a strange thing that you say, <laughs> that you need to trust Jesus Christ so you can go to heaven. I'm not saying that. I'm just reporting to you what Jesus said. Do you remember what he said? 
He said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man comes to the Father except through me. Do you want to go to heaven when you die? The only way you're going to get there is through Jesus Christ. There's not plan A, plan B, and plan C. There's only one plan. It's God's plan. I know that we live in an age of pluralism, and toleration is the key word, but I don't care very much about being tolerant or don't even care about being liked. I just want to be truthful. The Bible is very true, and the Bible says God has a plan whereby you can go to heaven and spend eternity with him forever and ever and ever. And you can execute that plan right here, right now, right here in this place. You can put your name on God's 9-11 list. And when the rapture comes, you will hear the call, the voice of an archangel, the shout and the trump of God. And you will be called up to be with him. His purpose in writing to the Thessalonians about the rapture is expressed in his final words. Comfort one another with this truth. So I have to ask you, were you comforted by this message about the rapture? If you're a Christian, you should be assured about the future. But perhaps the idea of death and Christ's return was a bit discomforting. If so, I hope you'll exchange discomfort for comfort by putting your eternal trust in Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior. Take me to your